My name is Charlene Margot, and I am the proud co-founder of Nonprofit The Parent Venture. We are delighted to have with us tonight Alice Kleeman, who will be moderating College Admission, What Really Matters, with Laura Stratton from Scripps College and Gabby McColgan from Castilea School. Welcome, Alice, Gabby, and Laura. Thank you. Thank you so much, Charlene. And one of the things I always like to mention is that while the parent education presentations are always free of charge, they are not free of cost. So donations to the parent education series are always welcome. And Charlene is always too humble to ask for those. So I will. Okay, so what really matters about my introductions of Laura Stratton and Gabby McColgan? Well, to me, it's the fact that we've all been friends for years, but more officially, Laura Stratton holds the admission reins at Scripps College, which is the women's college among the Claremont colleges, and a superb example of the best of liberal arts colleges. Less officially, I bet you didn't know that Laura is a hardcore Peloton rider. She's logged over 950 rides in the last few years. And she's also an enthusiastic outdoors person who goes totally off the grid for three weeks every summer. And she highly recommends Olympic National Park. And I'm sure that Gabby would second that national park recommendation. In addition to being the director of college counseling at the historic all-female Castilea School in Palo Alto, Gabby is on track to visit every national park in the United States. She's already visited 38 of the 63. And when she isn't national parking, uh, she's using her operatic training to sing with Peninsula Cantare. She's going to sing in The Music Man with the Palo Alto Players coming up um, sometime this spring, and I suggest all of us go. Um, so I would like to launch this conversation about what really matters by asking Laura to define a term that some people may not even be familiar with, but one that is super important in this discussion. The term is institutional priorities. I hope you've heard it before, but if not, you'll understand it now. Laura, can you please define this term with maybe some examples from your own experience? And then after that, Gabby, could you please follow by letting us know what your students know or think about institutional priorities and what you kind of wish they understood better? And then Gabby, when it's your turn, if you could also just touch on what this term means in the context of public schools like the UC and CSU. So Laura, take it away. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alice, for the, the lovely introduction. and. And to all of you for being here tonight um, and, and being on this little journey with us to talk about college. And Gabby, I think it's official. We've got to start going to national parks together. So we'll do that. And then we'll sing while we're there. Why not? Um, I love it. I love it. Um, so in terms of this concept of institutional priorities, it is as an admission administrator and someone who uh, is in charge of um, sort of bringing in a class to Scripps College every year. It is how we sort of wrap our arms around the students who we uh, can bring into the campus. And it is a series of, of sometimes competing, um, but often complementary facets of a college as both a community and a business. Uh, and so when, when we uh, sit down and, and we start to think about the, the values that drive us, um, we look to our mission. So if you first want to know what a uh, college's institutional priorities are, you can nerd out, as I often do, and look up mission statements of colleges. And at least for Scripps, there are four pillars of our mission. And whenever we're thinking about a student, and if we're going to offer them a space in our community, is, is there alignment uh, between who the student is, right, who they're presenting, 
in the application and who we are as an institution. So are we able to find those things in the application? Um, are we able to find things like creativity, service, integrity, and leadership, which are the four pillars of our mission? That's on sort of the personal level. Um, other institutional priorities are, are more clear cut, right? So we think about um, as much as we would love to admit every single student who's qualified uh, to, to be admitted to Scripps, we just can't because we're limited in space. And so we think about institutional priorities like um, the size of the class that we can bring in, um, a balance of academic interests. Are the student's academic interests well served by Scripps, right? So if a student comes in and is very set on a particular major that we don't offer, um, there probably isn't alignment between um, what the student is interested in and, and what we can offer. There are also different things like we need to fill an orchestra, right? And we need to fill sports teams and we need to make sure that we have students who are going to go out into the world and to do, um, to do our values in action. And so those are some of the institutional priorities that we consider um, when we are thinking about building a community. And just, I wanna stress one more thing. One thing I hear a lot from admission people is this idea of fit, right? Like a student is a fit at a school. And I've always disliked that because I feel like it kind of goes with that thing of like fitting into a, a pair of jeans, right? Or a pair of shoes. And that doesn't feel good either sometimes. So instead, what I think of is, you know, you're coming, students, you're coming into the college admission process with your own dreams, your own hopes, your own goals, your own experiences, your own strengths. And we as a college can offer certain things um, academically, socially, residentially, and really, it's just about do those things line up? Um, and then it isn't about a prize to be won, but instead really looking for that connection between a college and a student. And hopefully that can help to alleviate a certain amount of pressure um, that students are feeling to fit in to what we're looking for in an application. So with that, I'll turn it over to Gabby to talk a little bit more. Thank you, Laura. And I, I'll start by thinking about, as I talk with my students, as I talk with, with our families, we like to, to remind families that selectivity comes into play quite a bit as we talk about institutional priorities. Mm -hmm. And for most colleges in this country, the vast majority of excellent colleges in this country, they don't have to worry too much about institutional priorities. Their institutional priority is they bring in, they bring in students who can do the work and will graduate, right? They're able to come and those application processes can be quite straightforward because their institutional priority might be you need to have a minimum GPA, you might need to have taken a set of courses, and you're in, right? Let's, I, I'd love to highlight our phenomenal community colleges in California. These are open enrollment schools. They are not trying to keep students out. They are trying to, to welcome students in because that is their institutional priority to serve the families in California, offering a low cost, if not free education to our incredible high school students who are ready and even students at any age in our community. So the more that institutional priorities come into play, the more the longer that list of institutional priorities gets, usually correlates with how selective a particular college is. And since most colleges in this country are not particularly selective, um, when we start to get into things like, can a student afford to pay the tuition? You know, has a do they have a family member who has graduated from that college? Is that an institutional priority? The longer that list gets, I find, has everything to do with how selective that school is and how complicated the decisions they are making are. Um, and that can feel really confusing for my students and, and our families, right? But how, you know, how do I know? What, who do I want to be for this school? And I really believe that the most important thing is that the research, and Laura, you said it so beautifully, to find schools for yourself where your goals can be realized, where you can do the things that are so important to you. Not every school is the right, not every college is the right college for you. You are not the right fit. I, I do use the word fit sometimes, Laura. I'm so sorry. I'm taking it's it away. It's taking ingrained it in us. It's part yeah. of our, what yeah. we do. <laughs> sometimes the, the college is not the right fit for you. How about mm -hmm. we say it that way? Um, because that matters a lot. Um, so institutional priorities, 
Not every college is transparent about what their institutional priorities are. Sometimes they don't even know what their institutional priorities are in a particular year. I began my admission career working for the San Francisco Conservatory of Music. And whether or not we needed a tuba that year had everything to do with whether we had a tuba player, right? Like, so mm -hmm. it, it very much was informed by what are our needs in this moment. And so when, when my students will say, well, well, what are they looking for? My answer is you be yourself because you don't know what they're looking for. So you have to just be the best, you be yourself, right? And then you trust that where, where that match is going to happen, it will happen. Um, and then Alice, it's a, should I jump into the UC and Cal State? I'd love, is it time well, or did I miss anything? Sure, just briefly explain. Yeah. I, of institutional priorities even make sense. Yes, and I actually love the University of California and California State University, well, for many reasons, but I love them especially because as a public institution, their institutional priorities are transparent. They're in fact published on their website. Mm -hmm. You can go to the UC's website, you can Google 13 comprehensive review factors, and you can see a list of 13 things that the different UC campuses are able to consider as they are considering their many wonderful qualified applicants in order to build a class of wonderfully excellent students in all realms, both academically and then in all of the different things they do outside the classroom. So when I talk to my students about their UC personal insight questions, which many of you in this webinar might be working on right now, November, right? We're working on our University of California applications and our personal insight questions. I ask my students to go to that list of 13 factors and really think about the fact that UC is telling you exactly what they want to know about you. So your job is to tell them the information that will support their institutional priorities and see that you are would be a wonderful match for them. Um, so that's just my plug for the, the 13 review factors for the UC. Thank you, UC. We love their transparency. I've, it makes me think, Gabby, of, of one thing, too, and this is uh, something when I talk to students, like if I'm visiting high schools or at college fairs, is just acknowledging the fact that we as colleges often do a very poor job of differentiating ourselves. And so, like, how do you start to learn about institutional priorities? And I think there are some ways that students can sleuth um, if you're not, like, ready to join a mailing list yet. And um one thing that COVID gave us was the um, directive to really up our game with social media. So you can start to follow like college admission offices. I know it's scripts. All, almost all of our content is student driven. Um, and so they'll do student takeovers and just to start to see like, are these the types of people, right? And, and I wouldn't say don't base it on an N of one, you know, but if you start to see, you look at these things and you think, oh, these are the kind of people I think are interesting, or these are classes I would find interesting. I think that is just that first little like thing, right? And then you dig in and you say, what are the class sizes? What are the majors? But I think if you go first to those nitty gritty things, you can lose the sort of ethos or the the culture part, which I think is one of the hardest things to suss out. So I think social media can be great if admission officers are visiting your high school or doing college fairs in your area. And I still think that the best way when if and when you have the opportunity is to visit, because mm -hmm. um, then you really can see it in action. Yeah. Okay, so one of the things that I take away from both of your discussions about institutional priorities is that there are factors in college admission that really matter but there are some where the student has some agency, some control, and others where you just don't know if that's what that school is looking for. So I think as we continue, we'll get into the areas of where do students have a little more control. Um, let's talk about the various components of the application. Um, Laura, throughout all the years I've done this work, the transcript has held the honors as the most important component. Can you please talk about the transcript's role? And then Gabby, after that, we'd love to know what your students think about the value of their transcripts. Do they understand all the points that Laura is going to make about its significance? So take it away, Laura, the transcript. I appreciate the the you know really putting the transcript at the center of of the application and 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 
in saying that it does not mean that it has to be a perfect transcript, right? So we're going to talk a little bit about that. But when I open an application, and, and again, like the institutional priorities are sort of the foundation under which we are then looking at individual students. But the questions I ask myself is, will this student be successful, right? Not only will they come to Scripps, but will they graduate from Scripps? And then how will they contribute to and take advantage of the opportunities in our community? So that charge of is this student academically prepared is critical um, because we don't just want to bring students, we want to graduate students. And the best indicator of that is previous work in the classroom. So um, some, some hot takes about the transcript. Working at a place that is highly selective and that is not a UC or Cal State, I do not care what your GPA is. Like that number that sits at the bottom, if your school still has that number, and I always love it too when there's like eight of them, right? It's like nine to 12, nine to 12 academic, 10 to 12, 10 to 12 weighted. And I'm like, look at all these little numbers that don't mean anything without context. And so I think that the context here is really important. So when I'm looking at a transcript, I'm looking at a lot of different things. The first is what is actually offered at a school, right? So like, I'm never going to penalize a student if they haven't taken a class that wasn't offered at a school. Also, many schools have, have decided to go in different directions with curriculum. So some schools have decided to move their rigorous academic program into an, an international baccalaureate curriculum or an honors curriculum or an AP curriculum. It's our job as admission people to know those ins and outs. Um, and we work with people like Gabby, your counselors let us know exactly what's offered at your school. So that's the first question I have is what's actually offered there. Then I'm looking at how can I suss out the student's interest and aptitudes with where they've decided to take advanced classes. Um, so are those classes um, more in the realm of the humanities? Are they more in the arts? Are they more in STEM? And then I start to get an idea of, okay, this is where I think the student's interests and aptitudes lie. And then I look at the grades. Um, most highly selective places will look at all of your classes in academic. Um, and, and what we consider academic is English, math, science, social science, and a language other than English. Um, and we also are looking at, are there trends in those grades over time? So has a student maybe had a little dip somewhere, right? A semester where things seem to go a little bit wacky. And then that's my responsibility to see if that's discussed anywhere else in the application. Um, and so looking at, is there a trend that maybe a student struggled at the beginning of high school, but really picked up steam as things went on? Um, or in the opposite, you know, was there something where the student had a downward trend in grades? Um, and if that's the case, then how do we sort of have the confidence the student can be successful? So it's looking at the transcript as a whole document that I think is really important. And I will say, um, reviewing applications uh, through COVID has required admission officers and admission application readers to really understand context. Because as many of you may remember, all of a sudden, all the classes went to pass fail and there was no failing. And it was, you know, some classes could be taken um, in a block schedule. You were going to class every other day, right? We had to learn all of that along with you all. The nice thing is that we've done it now enough for enough years. Nothing really phases us anymore. It's just we need to, again, be able to suss out if a student has taken on a challenging program. And um, I don't want students to think that a challenging program means every single honors AP, IB, blah, 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 community college class that you could possibly take. Um, because what we're hoping is that when you arrive at a college campus, that you are still an, an intact human being um, mm -hmm. who has not pushed so far to the limit academically that you're already burned out. Um, so I always think it's good to take rigor in your areas of interest and things that really light you up. Um, and if you're a person who loves everything uh, and you really wanna take those honors and AP classes, then you should be in a place where you're gonna continue to do that in college. And I think that's a really good indicator of being at a place that's pretty intellectually challenging. So. Those are my thoughts about the transcript. Gabby, what are your students saying though? Does, does that sound like what they actually think it is? <laughs> yeah, so it's so good. So first I wanna define my students. So yes, yeah. I am so excited and I love, love, love being at Castilea. Um, 
And I also have worked at two other high schools prior to this role. And I also work every year with an incredible group of students at Breakthrough Silicon Valley. Big shout out to Breakthrough Silicon Valley. So I, when I'm talking about my students, I am not only talking about my Castilea students because we're all, every high school will be different. The context will be different. I think that there are a few things that I hear students saying that I would argue, and I think Laura, you will agree, is not accurate. And the fir first one you covered, right? They're very concerned about their GPA. <laughs> and I constantly try to remind them, not really anybody cares about that GPA, right? We are far more interested in the courses you have chosen to take and the individual grades you have received in those courses. Um, and then the other thing that I, I get a sense of is that they think they're supposed to do everything as fast as possible. I need to accelerate. Can I skip that class to get into another class so that I can show that I, and actually I, and Laura, you correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't believe that colleges are looking for that. I, I believe that colleges are looking for students to engage deeply in the material that is being offered, to find the things they love, to really build strong foundational skills, and then to choose those rigorous courses, as you said, in the subjects that matter to them most. So it, for all of you here in the webinar, please don't think that acceleration is the goal. It really is not. And it's okay to be right where you're supposed to be and to get really good at the thing that you're learning. Um, the other thing that we talk about with our students, uh, we often hear, well, Ms. McColgan, junior year is supposed to be my most rigorous year. Mm -hmm. So I have to take all of my best classes in junior year so that I can go to a good college. And I have to disabuse them of this notion because that is not in fact true. Your rigor should be maintaining or increasing with each year that you get older. So your senior year should actually be the way, the place where you are choosing some more of the rigorous coursework. Again, not all, because that's another myth that you already busted for us, Laura. Thank you. But they think I have to take everything. I have to take all of the things. You don't. So to, to don't run out of great classes to take in senior year because you're trying to pop them, push them all into junior year. Um, and to your point, Laura, that's going to make junior year really unhealthy and unhappy. And you won't be able to be your best self outside of the classroom if that's what you're trying to take on. So um, I think those were just some of the extra pieces, but the, the, the more is not necessarily better is just my mantra. More is not necessarily better. Go do the most with what you have. Don't try to take on too much. Go deep. Don't go broad. And then keep oh. taking all of your classes. That's an, Oh, can I add another thing Yes. that, Oh, well, I don't really like math and I don't have to take math my junior or senior year. So I'm not going to take math that makes, and, and we could insert any class there. I would argue that every year of high school, you should be trying to take five core academic classes each year. And that might mean you don't take math, but then we would like, I'd like you to take two of something else, two English classes to replace that class that you no longer want. And I, I really want to push back on students who say, well, it's senior year, I'm just going to take my three classes and be done. I, I really want you to have four and five would be fantastic. That even still leaves room for an elective. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I, I think too that that speaks to like if if you as a student and knowing yourself are like I'm done right like I don't want to take any more you should then probably be looking at colleges that have requirements that align with your academic personality there are colleges where I think you go and you can work really hard or you can work moderately hard there are other colleges like I am consistently surprised and in awe of how intellectual and hardworking script students are, right? And, and so I think too, some of this is the stuff that you start to suss out. Mm -hmm. um, but again, if you're a person who's like, I don't wanna take more than three classes in junior and senior year, but I think I'm gonna be admitted early to Harvard, like that's not gonna happen. And so some of it is that knowing of yourself and then starting to ask those questions of colleges. But I, I will say the, the acceleration and the staying in academic solids is a huge thing that we talk about. And some of that is just, we want to know you have recent preparation and being able to manage that level of courses when you get to college. 
Um, you know, one of the areas where that comes up a lot, I have found, is with um, foreign language. And um, my thought about that also is if you've completed certain requirements by finishing, say, French 3, you don't speak French yet. You've just built a foundation to learn French, and you're stopping before you can construct anything upon that foundation. But moving along, um, I've heard a lot of students say some version of this. Well, I haven't done that great in school, but oh man, my extracurriculars are amazing. So Laura, how does this strike you, especially in light of what you've just said about the transcript? <laughs> and Gabby, do your students sometimes think this way? How does that work out? I mean, I, I think that that's a, a normal reaction for a lot of teenagers, right? It's like you kind of are like, ooh, I'm in this spot where I can't go back and change, you know, these things that happened two or three years ago. So how can I shore up where I'm at? Um, I, I do think, though, that this is um, having a strong extracurricular, co-curricular profile, meaning like things that you like to do besides being in class or, you know, doing homework or projects. That's a wonderful thing. It is the thing that as we have come back to an in-person living experience every so often, I just like stop and I'm just so, so, so grateful, right? That like Gabby gets to do Music Man this spring, right? That my kids get to go trick-or-treating, right? Like those things, like it is really special. So I, I understand students wanting to throw themselves into life outside of the classroom. I do think though that it, if possible, I would like for it to not be at the expense of a student's academic experience. And this is where thinking about how many honors and AP classes can I actually handle when I'm also wanting to be in ASB and be in the choir and do community service, right? I think that it's important to think about your values and the things that are important to you. And similarly with rigor, more is not always better. Um, in terms of extracurriculars. So often, um, you know, we'll have students where you get to that section of the common application and they've filled every single box and they've attached a resume, which please don't attach a resume, um, right? So all of these things and it's like, I've been in, but it's like one hour a week or it's one hour a week for two weeks a year. And I would rather see the things again that you really enjoy pouring yourself into because whatever those things are that you pour yourself into, in high school, you're going to bring that same thing of pouring yourself into whatever it is that you fall in love with in college. So I think it's great to have practice in terms of extracurricular interests, but I do think you have to balance it with being able to also get your schoolwork done and to be a successful student. Because again, college is not summer camp, right? Like college admissions, people love to talk about how you're going to come there. You're going to have so much fun. You're going to make all these friends and you're going to go to yoga and be in the dining hall. And all of that is true, but we are first and foremost institutions of learning. And we have to know that you're going to be able to be successful um, in the classroom. And so I don't think it can overtake academics, but I do think that there's value in having fun and having other interests. Yeah. I love that. I'm, I'm going to quote one of my mentors, Julie Ball, who used to say, performance predicts performance. And yeah. the college application is a way for colleges to try to figure out who you will be when you get to their campus. And they make that decision based on who you have been in high school, right? And so that academic piece is critical and you need to be taking good classes and doing reasonably well. And as Laura already said, that doesn't mean you have perfect grades, but it means that you are a good student and overall you're doing, you know, you're, you're doing the work that needs to be done to demonstrate your readiness. And the same is true of your activities. I would, I think, Laura, you would agree, you're not necessarily, as you just said, looking for the student who does 25 things once. You're looking for the student who does four or five things well, right? And is really committed to them because that's the type of student and leader and creator you want on your campus. And of course, every college is different. Some colleges do not consider your resume or your activities list when they're considering your application. So everybody's different. Um, but for those colleges who do care about who you are outside of the classroom, it's, it is quality, not quantity. And I think my students, 
are often surprised. They get to junior spring and we start looking at college applications and I show them that they are limited to 10 spots. And they say, but wait a minute, where does all of my other stuff go? And I say, it doesn't go anywhere. In your heart. <laughs> if you, you have done it and you have loved it, but it is now your job to curate the list of things you've done and share the 10 or the eight or the five that have been most important to you during high school to communicate to these colleges what you value. So I love it when colleges have some limitations on how many things students can list. I think that's helpful. Um, and students, I think a big myth, I think what really matters is not that you fill every spot on that list. That That is a maximum, not a goal. And that's a, a mantra that we have. 10 is the maximum. It's not the goal. And so if you want to use all 10 spots for your activities on the common application, wonderful. But if you're using five or three, and those are things you have done long-term and deeply, that is just as valuable. And it's also, I think, super helpful when colleges let students know that they take a broad look at what constitutes an activity. If you are picking up your siblings after school, taking them home and making dinner for them, first of all, that counts if oh, yeah. you you'll write about that. But second of all, it gets in the way of doing a whole bunch of other things. So students need to have a really open mind about what they might put in with their activities. Does that make I think sense? a good rule of thumb, Alice, is for students to think about it of how do I spend my time mm -hmm. when I'm not physically in class or doing schoolwork? Right. And I'm, I was going to say this thing about family responsibilities. If you translate for your family, if you're calling about medical bills, if you're, you know, shuttling around grandparents or siblings, also if you work, um, work is a wonderful thing that you can put down in the co-curricular section of your applications. And then the last thing I would say too is um, you're also allowed to change your mind. We see often at Scripps that students who are drawn to our community tend to be very driven um, and they have a plan. And there's frankly nothing that I love more in an application than seeing someone who quits something that they no longer love. Mm -hmm. So if you have been, often it's ballerinas and gymnasts, if you've been a ballerina or a gymnast or any other thing where you're like, I got into this and by 10th grade, I didn't love it anymore. That's fine. There's this wonderful part on any application. Is there anything else that you want us to know? And that's where you can just talk about any of those sort of disruptions or your family moved or, you know, other things affected your ability to be involved in extracurriculars. We just want to know what the context is so that we can look at it thoughtfully. Um, but yeah, that thing about staying in something just to stay in it, you don't need to do that. Because again, that doesn't bring you to college as a, a whole functioning person, then you're just burned out. And they do not want to scrape you off the floor of the Thank you. So <laughs> now let's move into a little discussion of my very least favorite subject, sad face, testing. How has the landscape changed with testing? How has its role changed? And then Gabby, please, please, please tell me that the senior I met this fall who planned to drive to Fresno to take the SAT when she wasn't applying to any colleges that asked for it, please tell me that student is in the minority. And I wonder how your students are viewing testing. But Laura, how has the landscape changed? Yeah, this is actually one of the bright spots in COVID, with COVID. Um, so a very interesting story is that Scripps um, had done a two-year longitudinal study about testing just prior to COVID and had made the decision with our board of trustees to go permanently test optional. And we were so excited, right? We were like, oh my God, this is so great. We feel great about it from our values perspective, of not expecting students to test. We felt really confident. And then I'm not kidding you, a week later, the world shuts down, testing goes away, and now the majority of colleges are either test optional, which is what Scripps is, or a test free, meaning that they don't even look at testing if you've taken it. So I see that as a real win um, because what we know is that the SAT is predictive of, at best, first semester college performance. Um, and I gotta be honest, like I was super nervous to evaluate applications without testing the first year. 
because I'd always had it, you know, it was just this one other little piece. I don't miss it at all. Like I really don't. And, and I think for students to know that if you're applying to schools that are test optional, particularly if you choose not to submit testing, we don't think, oh, well, they must have been a terrible test taker. That is not how we feel about it. Instead, we think for whatever reason, you as a student decided not to test or decided not to submit your testing. And then that little piece of the pie goes away and something else just fills in for it, right? The strength of the program or letters of recommendation or whatever the other things are. Um, but I, I would ask just as we trust that what you're submitting to us is um, factual and and true that if a college says that they are test optional, please do take us at our word. Um, we don't frankly care if you submit testing. And I do think a good rule of thumb and a way to exert quite a bit of agency in this process is to look at a school's average test scores. And if a school is test optional, you should only submit those test scores if you are at the upper boundary of their average, um, because that's to your benefit. So that's a, a quick take of if you should or should not submit testing, but um, I think it's a personal choice. I understand why some students still take it, um, but- Drive to Fresno to take it. That's three hours. Yeah. And I, I think it's one of these things of like, I also am like, students gotta make their own choices, you mm -hmm. know? And, and I, we can only say so often that that's not our preference. That's not how we would want them to spend their time. Um, but I, I think that I'd be interested, Gabby, what the sort of vibe is yeah. in your community if students will actually step away from testing altogether. Yeah, I, I will, I will take full ownership that that is something we strongly encourage at Castileo. We encourage a confident opting out of testing entirely. Um, in the Bay Area, it is so hard to find places to take the SAT and the ACT. Mm -hmm. And it is such a burden on our colleagues at the high schools that offer these tests to do so, that it's a real power play, we argue, to opt out and say, I'm not dealing with this silliness. I, I don't wanna do it. Um, most of my students do not opt out, right? I, they, they're, not, they're not listening to me, what do I know? But that I wanna know, I want you to know that that's, that's where I live and I really want as many colleges as possible to go test free because I think one of the main stressors that I see with, with all of the students that I work with is the agony of test optional of what do I do, right? Am I supposed, and I think your advice, Laura, is right on the money, right? Look at the, the college's published test scores. If you're in that in the, in the upper half, it's probably of a benefit to you. Um, but it's really hard for students. It's extremely stressful. Every, you know, they might be submitting to some schools, but not others. It adds a layer of anxiety and work that that I think is just unnecessary. So I'm really looking forward to all of our wonderful test optional colleges feeling even more confident and going test free as our UC and Cal State did. And speaking of institutional priorities, that's a big one, right? That's one that maybe the admission office doesn't get to make that decision. That could actually sit with the faculty or the, the president. So no, I, Laura, you are my hero. So you're doing all the things. This is, this is not to say that, but that's just something for families to know that whether or not a college requires testing may have very little to do with what the admission office would actually like. It may be mandatory mandated from the state legislature, who knows? Who knows why a college is asking for testing, but should a student be driving to Fresno, Alice? No. Thank you. <laughs> no. Well, both of you have offered some reassurance. I hope the people listening are thinking, phew, we may not have to do that at all. Um, so what about other factors? How about the essay? Do we really need to pay attention to the alarm bells in social media about the role of AI? Um, has technology changed the role that the essays play in admission? And then Gabby, tell us please what, what your students think the essay's role is and how that affects their application related behavior. And I wonder if the two of you also share my belief that the supplemental essays and questions for many colleges matter the most. So take it away on the essay, Laura. Yeah, I, I love, I will um, admit to the fact I was raised by a 35 uh, year public 
school English teacher um, who loves to read and loves to write. And I love to read and I love to write. And I remember sitting down when I was 17 years old and it's like everything that had ever happened to me left my brain, right? And I was like, what am I going to write about? I've had the most basic life, right? Um, and, and even the parts of it that weren't so basic to me in that moment where it seemed just like this huge, like, I had this responsibility to pour out who I was. I had no idea what to write about. Um, and, and so if, if students have felt that way or are feeling that way, it's very normal, um, I think, to feel that way. And the reality is you are probably not going to write about something that we have not already read about, right? So I've been reading applications for 20 years. And the expectation in the essay is not to write on a topic that is the first time anyone has ever read about this thing. Um, instead, I think that the, the essay allows for a student to share what they see as the most salient and important part of who they are. Um, and I think that I heard this one time from a, a, a colleague and he said, you know, it's pretty simple. Start with the end in mind. What is the one characteristic about yourself that you want an admission person to remember? And then tell one story that shows that thing. I'm caring, I'm adventurous, I'm, um, I don't know, whatever it would be, right? And then, and then tell one story because the essay sits right in the middle of the physical application. So we've already gotten to know you a little bit and then we're gonna get to know you a lot after that. It doesn't sit as a standalone writing sample. Um, and so I think that's really important to remember. I do still think it should be well-written. Um, you should think about your own voice and the quality of it. And if you're on version 120 on a Google Doc, you need to be done. Because if you go much further than that, you're going to lose the part of you in it. And it's going to sound like it was written by a 45-year-old person, right? Which is not who we want applying to college. Uh, I do think that your comment about supplemental essays, Alice, is an interesting one. And just for folks who don't know, there are some colleges that once you add a school like to the common application, you then get access to what we call the member screen, which are specific questions to that college. Um, I love the supplemental essays because I think that it allows a student maybe to speak to topics that are specific to our school that they wouldn't feel comfortable addressing in a larger essay. It also allows me to look at, um, is the quality of the writing the same? Right. So I think of the personal essays where students spend so much time and then potentially the, the supplemental essays are kind of dashed off. Right. So if in the personal essay, it's here is my life story. And then they start the member screen writing with, hey, girl, you know, can't wait to talk to you about scripts. Then I'm like, well, there's something happening here that's just maybe um, I need to figure out where the real quality of the writing is. I also think students and families, if you're looking for a place of agency and looking for institutional priorities and, and this idea of alignment, look at what colleges ask in their supplemental essays. And if you look at those and you're like, I don't care about any of that, right? Then I do think it's just an alarm bell where you think, oh, maybe we need to do a little more research because we spend a lot of time thinking about what we ask and we're really interested. Um, and the, uh, the final thing is when you're writing your essays, you get to those supplemental questions write about something different, right? If you wrote your personal essay about community service, write in your member screen essay about travel or about creative pursuits or being a sister or a daughter, right? That we want to know you as a whole person. This can often be a trap for athletes um, or people who are really into the arts, right? And they want to write every single essay about that one thing they love, but write about some different stuff because that helps us to see what you'll be like in, in our community. Nice. And I, I will come in for what, what do my students think? They think they need to have to have something earth shattering to share in their essay. This is, this is the moment they're going, it's fireworks are happening. No. And that's a, a myth that we try to bust as often as possible. We love it when colleges bust that myth as well. It is normal and ordinary is okay and expected. They think they need to sound like a professional writer who's publishing for the New Yorker. That is not the goal. They need to sound like a 17 year old. They need to use their own language. Um, they need to put the thesaurus away. That is something we talk a lot about in our, in, as I'm helping my students as they are proofreading their essays, 
where did this word come from? Is this a word you use? Well, I thought it sounded good, right? Sure, but it doesn't sound like you, right? Mm -hmm. it, it The college really appreciates the student's voice. I really appreciate my students' voices. And that, that I think is what students think matters is that they're supposed to be highly polished. I know their parents sometimes think I better get in there and I, I better clean that up because if somebody wrote me a cover letter that that wouldn't fly. It's not a cover letter. It is a personal essay from a 17 year old and that's what it's supposed to sound like. Now, I also want to have the flip side. We've talked about the University of California before. The UC does not use essays in the same way that common application colleges use essays. UC does not actually care about the writing quality or the student's voice that much. They're using the personal insight questions to really gather critical information mm. so that the student can share information about who they are, what they do, the context of their upbringing. So a lot of what we, Laura and I are talking about right now is less applicable to the UC. Um, and just keep in mind, UC gives you very clear instructions on how to do those personal insight questions on their website. So be very clear as you are completing your UC essays. The other thing I want to talk about is I think students begin the essay writing process dreading it. And they say, oh, I don't want to apply to any colleges that have supplemental essays. How dare they make me do all of this extra work? And we just got to November 1st. Most of my students have now submitted their first application. Although remember, if you haven't applied, you're not late. Everybody oh. is right on time. They are now mad about the opposite. They get really frustrated by the colleges that don't ask them supplemental essays because they have realized the power of getting to reflect on who they are, what matters to them. Sometimes when students write their essays, they're actually figuring out what they want to major in in college, figuring out whether or not that college is the right match for them. And that is so powerful. So my goal is for every student to enjoy and be proud of the writing that they submit because it's a piece of who they are, whether it's super polished language or just the voice of a 17 year old exactly where it's supposed to be. What matters is their process of writing and what they choose to write about. And I do love the UC personal insight questions because they're just that. They're not essays. In fact, I've told my students, if I call it an essay by accident, give me a small electrical shock. <laughs> In all these years, no one has shocked me. But um, I really appreciate that the UC just says, answer the question. Um, I have about four more questions for you two before we get to Q&A, but we don't have a ton of time. So we're going to kind of zip through a couple of these. Um, some other factors in the application process and how do they matter? How do they matter? I know they matter. Letters of recommendation and interviews. And can you please explain the role of demonstrated interest at some colleges? Do colleges let students know if demonstrated interest plays a role? And Gabby, same, what do your students think about some of these other application pieces? So just a quick take on letters of recommendation, interviews, and demonstrated interest, each of which we could fill an hour with. Yeah, I, I think um, similar to the transcript, we think of letters of recommendation within the context of the school, right? That um, the students who are at an independent school with, you know, small classes and teachers, you know, they are probably going to be writing very different letters than someone who has a class of 40 students. And so we really do think about it in that way. Letters of recommendation usually, and the interview usually confirm other things that we've seen in the application. Uh, I do think it's good if students are thinking about letters of recommendation, if a college requires more than one, to think about getting them from teachers in different disciplines. Um, but we're really trying to suss out the type of community member that a student will be from a counselor recommendation, the type of student um, that you will be from those teacher recommendations. Nice. And I'll jump in if it's okay to talk about demonstration of interest. Mm -hmm. Thank so, you. So DOI, as we affectionately call it, demonstrated interest is, you know, the college, some colleges, many do not, some colleges are trying to gauge the likelihood of the applicants. I've reframed that. They're trying to figure out if you'll come. They're trying mm -hmm. to say, if we admit you, 
are you going to choose us, right? And because it matters to colleges that they have enough students to attend their school. And actually most of the power, I think it doesn't feel this way for students, but most of the power rests with students for where they apply and for where they choose to attend. The college only gets a little piece of the power in that, in that big conversation. So Demonstrated interest is a way for colleges to figure out if you are engaging with them authentically and if you are likely to take their offer of admission seriously. You can find out if colleges track demonstrated interest. Thoughtful colleges make it very clear on their website and they say we do or we don't. Some colleges are a little bit less overt about that. You can still look it up. It's called the common data set and you can Google it and you can look it up. But I would argue you don't need to because if you are wondering how to demonstrate interest, be a good applicant. Yeah. Do your research. If there's a meeting, attend it. If there's an email, read it. If there's an event that you can attend, go to it. Learn about that college in an authentic, engaged way that's what demonstrating interest is. It's not a secret. There's nothing that my students think, oh my gosh, how do I break the code? There's no code. Just engage and you will be demonstrating interest. Um, colleges absolutely understand that there are families that can't fly around the country oh, yeah. and visit the campus. So you don't need to feel like you have to break the bank. Uh, a college, a wise college admission person I know said the best demonstrated interest is what they're putting in their application because it shows us if they get it about who we are and who they are. Those are helpful. Um, where does financial aid fit in? And the need for financial aid touches on another factor. What role does the student having a realistic college list play in this process? If you can each address that. Again, we could talk about that for an hour. Maybe Charlene will invite us back. Just make it a weekly series. Just the three of us just <laughs> yammering on about college. Um, yeah. So I, I do think um, financial aid is, is very important. And um, when I think about uh, the factors that a student and, and their family should consider, it's the academic part, right, of what a college can offer and how the student will engage, the social community part and financial Right. And that financial, the nexus is where those three come together. Um, I think it's important to talk about the financial investment of college early and often, which is often the first time that families are engaging with their child about a significant investment and in money. Um, but I think to know upfront what your family's ability to pay is, and that is not, um, that is usually a dollar amount, and, and that's fine. And then I think, uh, the family can be talking about that, asking questions related to things like scholarships, related to financial aid documents, related to need-based financial aid of individual colleges. And so my, my suggestion is to talk about it early and often. It's also fair to ask colleges if there's something called need aware, which means that the college takes into account a family's ability to pay um, as part of the application process. And, and in terms of the list, I think then it is what are the um, six to 10 colleges, right, that have varying levels of selectivity and financial aid offerings and academic programs that really the student would be happy to go to any of them, um, but that likely will provide different opportunities in those areas. Um, I think that often the concern about supplemental essays, you were talking about Gabby, is when a student is totally overwhelmed by the number of colleges to which they're applying. Yep, and um, and that's fine. I remember lopping colleges off my list at the end because I didn't want to do any of those supplemental essays. So that's okay. Does students feel that way? But I do think that's probably a sign that a student is applying to too many schools. Yeah, I would definitely echo that. I want to add for the financial aid application process. I think a big myth that I think what students think matters is I'm going to apply for private scholarships and I'm going to fund my education mm -hmm. that way. And I think something that most families don't realize is that the best scholarships will come from the colleges themselves. The colleges are going to probably be much more likely to give your students a scholarship than the private scholarships. And most students have to apply for 10 to 20 different private scholarships to maybe get even a little bit. So taking into account whether a college meets full demonstrated need if you apply for financial aid, and then critically, completing the financial aid application process on time 
and completely. And families, parents, this is where you must support your students with this process. Even if they're taking the lead on it and filling out all the forms, you need to be able to give them your tax information, your W-2 so that they can get those forms submitted on time and completely so that they can have full consideration for financial aid at those colleges. And I think what some families forget is that it's two, you're doing two application processes at the same time, the application to the college and the financial aid application. And they're often happening in parallel. So mm -hmm. that's just a, especially for senior families in the space right now, please make sure you have sat down with your senior and you know what your financial aid deadlines and requirements are and help them complete them. Perfect. Okay, here's just a quick take. Um, Laura, colleges often say that they review applicants in the context of their high school. Mm -hmm. We know what that means. Tell everybody else what that means. And Gabby, you've worked at several high schools. So have you seen that borne out? What does it right. mean? So, so no, this it's it's so important. And I, I think um for students to know that wherever you are going to high school is the context in which your application will be evaluated. That um, most students throughout the country have no choice of where they go to high school, right? You go to your neighborhood high school um, and, and that's great. What context allows us to see is what is it like to be at your school? Academically, socially, athletically, artistically, what is the community of your school like? Um, and, and within that, sort of how have you existed, right? I always like, one of the things I love the most about visiting high schools is I get to actually like crawl into your space and see like, this is where students are going to class. This is where students are using the restroom. This is where students are parking their cars, whatever those things are. Because then when I'm reviewing applications, I have an idea of like, okay, that's what that's like to live there. Um, and, and similarly related to family context of opportunities and, um, you know, just what a, a community values or family values, that all comes through in the application. Um, and it's a funny thing that I do, which is less appropriate every year. But when I meet people my own age now who are old, and I always ask people, where did you go to high school? And people look at me and they're like, why do you care? Because I have this database of high schools from around the country that I have visited, and I can place them then where they grew up. And it's a great party trick, but it's also very strange. And that's our role. That's our job is to know the context of your school so that we can be fair in terms of seeing what you're bringing to the table and what opportunities you've had. Okay. Gabby, do you do that too? Are we, are we, oh, we totally do that. Any, anybody who has worked in college admission, we always leave. Oh, where'd you go to high school? And then we're like, mm -hmm. yes, I can put, you. oh yes, you're right off that freeway. And I remember yep. the, the college counseling. So, yeah. Fabulous. I love it. Um, I want to add into context the the my, what my students and families will often think. They'll say, "Oh, I, my friend at the high school three miles away has taken this many AP exams and this class. How am I ever going to get into college when my high school doesn't have those things?" Oh. That's not how it works, right? Mm -hmm. Colleges colleges are not ever going to compare the things you have chosen to do at your high school with what a student has chosen to do at another high school because they're different. And that means that high schools can have different grading systems, different courses, a different name for their advanced curriculum. They might offer APs or not. They might offer IB or not. And it doesn't matter to the college. So it only matters where you are and how you are taking advantage of that, of that space. Um, just really quickly, because we've hit 630, I want to go to the audience's questions and your answers, but um, could you each mention several of the areas of the application process where you feel students have the most control, the most agency, or possibly the least? Um, could you each do that kind of quickly. And, and then I've got some great questions that have been piling up here for you. Gabby, do you want to take this one first? Oh my gosh, I, I feel like it's almost the entire process. They are choosing what classes to take in high school. They are choosing what activities they want to do during high school or what responsibilities they take on during high school, how they support their family, whether with a job or just at home. They are choosing how much effort to put into their classes. They are choosing whether or not they want to run for 
vice president of that club one year. And then once they're filling out the application, they're choosing how they share that information, what they talk about, what they write their essays about. And then most importantly, they choose where to apply to college. And that your colleges have no control over that. That's the piece you control. And then you control how much you fall in love with those colleges by how much research you do. The more research, the more you will love the college. That's just a hundred percent correlation. Um, and then most importantly, you choose where to go to college. You get to make the ultimate decision. So that that's my short list. I could probably come up with more. What did I leave out, Laura? No, I mean, I, I, I think that's it. What I, I just want to be sensitive to, and I'm very sensitive to where students are related to the anxiety of this process, is having agency over this does not mean that you have to be perfect at it. And so... Um, or it's it's always this fine balance, I think, for students of you're in control and you don't have to control it. And, and that, I think, is it can be a tough, tough thing when you're 17. And for parents, if you want to know your role in all of this, it is to be the grown up um, in the room. And it is to pull out of your own anxiety and to see what your kiddos need in that moment, which I am learning daily with a sixth grader who can never remember his trumpet to take to school, right? But he has to learn that. And so I think it is this moment of um, just recognizing that having the agency and having the choice also doesn't mean that you're going to make a perfect decision. And it also doesn't mean that you're going to make a bad decision. There are many colleges where you will be equally happy and unhappy because that is being a person in the world. And and it's I it's also I think somewhat reassuring to know that there are areas where you don't have control. Yes. If they really need that tuba, if they really need that soccer player, it may not be your year. It's not personal. Yeah. So I think that's been important too. Okay, we're going to go to the audience's questions and I'm going to pose those that are likely to interest more people than just the questioner. And since I've asked Laura to respond first, uh, maybe we'll have Gabby's responses first. And I think we'll do this kind of like a quick takes, yes. um, not, uh, uh, not a lot of detail because wow, there are so many really good questions here. Um, one is about, um, you, you talked about uh, following the five core areas through high school. And then a parent or a, an attendee wants to know if they've completed something, if they complete the AP level of the foreign language in the junior year, um, how strict does that have to be for the senior year? Right. And so I love that. I think I can answer that quickly. That is, again, context, right? What is available to you? You're taking advantage of, of what is there. I also don't want you to misunderstand. There are students who can complete all five core academic disciplines, but maybe stopped their world language in sophomore or junior year and then replaced it with a second academic discipline to sciences in junior or senior year, right? So everybody is different. There's not one right path to follow. One doesn't preclude you from a college or guarantee you admission to another college. Um, if you have run out of classes and a discipline to take, replace it with something else or talk to your guidance counselor at your high school and see if there might be an option for you to, to go even deeper into that subject in a way you haven't thought of before. Perfect. Um Here's, here's a question. I think it's the last one that came in, but we'll ask it anyway. It seems like a lot of people are hiring outside college counselors. Is that needed? And why are they doing this? I, I can answer why are they doing this because they tell me because other people are doing this. But maybe you two would like to share your thoughts about that. I I um. I, I think it's important for colleges, particularly highly selected colleges, to accept our level of responsibility in this, right? Which is, as Gabby mentioned, with a process that's pretty opaque and that's maybe hard to understand. It's the first time usually you're doing it. You want a sense of reassurance and there is the feeling. I mean, we pay for personal trainers and, you know, all these other things in our lives. And we think this person is an expert and they're going to guarantee me a result. The reality is that no one can guarantee you a result. Um, and the best resources that you have are, are actually at your school. It's your teachers and your counselors. Um, it's also through community-based organizations and organizations like who are putting on this event. Um, 
So I, I understand why people are doing it. I think they want a sense of assurance, but um, I, I think particularly if you're in an independent school or a, a community-based organization, there is absolutely no need for it. Um, and otherwise, I just think you have to be a little bit careful because, right, like it's one more voice. It's one more person looking at the essay. It's one more person giving their advice. And as we know, like more isn't always better. I think a better exercise is for the student to go in and to think about who am I? What do I want? What do I really seek out in a college experience? And then to connect with the experts and professionals who are out there to help with that. So I understand why people are doing it. I think for most students, it's not necessary. Um, I'll repeat my own mantra, which is colleges are not asking 17 year olds to do anything that 17 year olds are not capable of doing. Yeah. Abby, what do you think about this hey, one? I think there's a, a real, I think that's a question to ask yourself. Why do you feel the need to do it? If it is because you think everybody else is doing it, that's we learned in high school, we're not supposed to do things because everybody else is doing them, right? You got to do what's right for your child. If you're thinking, oh, I my child can't do this, so I need somebody to do it for them, that is not a great way to support your child. This is a growth moment for them. This is a developmental moment for them. They can handle it and they need you to trust them to handle it. Um, and, you know, if it's we need somebody to manage our relationship because I don't know as a parent if I'm able to support my child with this. Maybe that's a conversation to continue, right? But be very, be a savvy consumer, do your research. If you do decide to hire somebody, make sure that they are a member of our professional organizations, that they are doing professional development, and they actually have some sort of credential and experience in the field and will complement rather then complicate the work your child is already doing at their high school. And I, I come at a, from, a, from a high school with very small student to counselor ratio. I'm, it's a very unusual place where I am here, but usually my students feel complicated and, and extra stress is put on them when they have that additional work. So be very thoughtful about how you move forward and then trust that you're going to make the decision that's right for your family. Here's a question that has come in to us. What if your student is an average athlete or not athletic at all? Should they try to participate in sports in high school? What does the student say about that? Does the student want to participate in sports? I, I get very nervous when the question is, should my kid do this to leverage on a college application? Because I feel what like that is, yeah. what it is setting good? them up for then it, it's, first of all, it's saying, well, if you do those things that it'll lead to this result, which is not always the case, but also too, it doesn't give them the opportunity to figure out what really does get them going, right? What really excites them, what really motivates them. And so I worry about the specter of college sitting so heavily on students' choices about how they spend their time. I mean, a student who loves doing pottery is going to be better than a student who was forced to play soccer. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I think you got to let the students figure out who they are. Yeah. It's okay to do things and be average at them if you love them. Yes. <laughs> because there's plenty of people in college. There's plenty of people in this webinar who are average at things and we do it anyway. And it brings us a lot of joy and that's okay. I think yep. that's important. <laughs> You yep. betcha. Um, so somebody sent in a question. I won't read the whole uh, specific one, but about students making choices about how to spend their summer mm. and contrasting um, doing something like backpacking or mountain biking with something that the questioner has put in quotation marks, something more serious like an internship or a research project. How would you advise students Oh man, I know what I would say. I, I, I mean, I'm happy to jump in. I, I would argue that summer is a time for rest and rejuvenation and it is not meant to be an extension of the school year. I also know there are some students who really enjoy academic stuff. And if that's something that lights them up and they would really love to be in a lab one summer, go for it. But it is just as valuable to have a job. It is just as valuable to watch your siblings. It is just as valuable to go on walks every day. And as I tell my students, make sure that you're going to watch some really bad streaming over this, like just get some terrible, terrible culture in your life because you got to rest, you got to re rejuvenate. So it's about finding that balance. Every student will be different. I think 
after ninth and 10th grade. I don't think it's about really diving deep or focusing on something really serious. I think it's about having a summer vacation. At maybe after sophomore or junior year, a student is starting to develop more interest. Maybe they try some things on a short term that allow them to go deeper into a particular subject. But again, every student is different and it does not impact whether or not they get into the college they want to get into. What matters is what do they take from the experience and how do they write about it or talk about it when they're applying to college? Whether that was a job, whether that was an internship, whether that was watching terrible Netflix. Yeah. Great answer. I'm going to ask you two more questions. Although this one is another one where we could probably spend about an hour on it. Um, so this one says... Um, Wait, I'm going to find it because I did. Oh, my daughter's college counselor explained to her that some of the schools on her list might have given her consideration five years ago. Have the requirements or expectations changed in these past five years? No, I am. <laughs> I, I think there are a lot of things just happening at colleges right now. So some of this is like very much in the weeds of our profession, but we're in the midst of um, just a declining population overall uh, that's affecting colleges. I think too, that we're seeing some students just opt out of college altogether, which is very sad to me. Um, and then also just the learning loss and, and some of the issues related to students feeling emotionally ready to go to college. I think those things are all affecting what's happening um, I think it's almost the opposite. I think that college is there for the taking right now. I really do. I think it is a student's market um, in terms of the application process. I I do believe, though, that, you know, I always have that moment where I turn on like the Today Show in April and they're like, no one got into college this year, right? If your sights are set on 10 colleges that continue to become more selective or the top 20 colleges that continue to become more selective, though they may have become more selective during those five years. That is not most colleges, and that's not even some highly selective colleges. And so I, I do think that while um, there are some colleges that continue to become more selective, the vast majority, that's not what's happening. And again, there is a seismic shift happening where the, the power is going to move even more to the students and families um, in the next few years. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. Remember, if your list is full of colleges that you don't feel like you can get into, then your list is not great. You need to expand your mind. You need to open up to the dozens and dozens of phenomenal colleges that will roll out the red carpet for you and would love to have you on their campus. That's most colleges. Um, last question, I think we can dispatch with fairly quickly with just opinions. How early would you recommend that high school students start planning what kinds of activities around college admissions, for example, how early should they start thinking about visiting colleges? Um, that's the question. I'm a fan of the spring of junior year starting to think about it, right? Do I want to go to college? What might I do if I get there? Maybe the summer before senior year, you visit some local colleges if you're able to. And remember, we live we have an embarrassment of riches in the Bay Area. You don't need to take fancy trips to go visit colleges. We have a dozen within three hour drive of this, more than a dozen, right? So start with local colleges, do some virtual tours. If you're going somewhere, visit a, visit a school there. But spring of junior year, plenty of time. Again, this is not that complicated. It's nothing that a 17 year old can't do on their own. It doesn't, I love that, Alice. It's such good, that's such a good mantra. It, anybody who tells you that, you know, it's ninth grade, it's too late, the, the the train is left is lying to you. They're trying to make you afraid. They're probably trying to sell you something. So let's just, let's pull it back. Junior year is fine. Laura, you, did it, yeah. that, Laura? No, I, I agree. I, I do think that there's such good content out there though, where students can lurk, right? Like if students mm -hmm. are like the social media thing, I think it's good to just like lurk around a college fair. Um, one of the funniest things that happened after COVID is like at a college fair, you usually like fill out an interest card. And the first college fairs we were going to after COVID, students were like, what am I supposed to do here? What, what, why do you have these papers here? What am I doing? Right. And so it's just 
give yourself the time to be new at it. It doesn't mean that you're an imposter. It doesn't mean that you don't belong. It just means you've never done it before. So if you know you're someone who needs a longer runway, go to college fairs and just hang out. Start to look at materials. Start to follow colleges on social media. And I like what you said, Gabby, about visiting local colleges. And then what are the characteristics of those colleges that are in other colleges, right? So if you go to you know, whatever type of school. And you're like, oh, this feels really good. The size, if it's, you know, private or public, then you can start to make those assumptions about other schools. And so I think that can also be helpful. Um, And finally, I would much rather that students spend the time leading up to junior year thinking more about who they are and who they want to become in college than how to get all that information, right? Because I think a student who's thoughtful about who they are and what they want. Um, It makes that alignment easier to find than if you're trying to find out that stuff and to find out about colleges at the same time. Thank you so much, Laura and Gabby. I think this has been really enlightening. I hope everybody else thinks so too. Charlene? I cannot thank you enough. I really just want to echo the words of one person who wrote in and said, I think this is the best college event I've ever attended. Kudos, Laura and Gabby. And, you know, Bev and I are both developmental educators. I met Alice. I was teaching her children when they were in preschool. I love it, Gabby, when you said that the college application process can be a developmental moment for your child. So parents, my only last piece of advice is try to enjoy it. Try to help your kid enjoy it because it can be a wonderful family thing to do together. I remember reading the essays that my kids wrote all together, and it was great fun to see what they thought. So I cannot thank Alice Kleeman for your brilliant moderation, Laura Stratton for all those great answers leading off everything. Gabby, thank you for giving us context and all your insights. And yes, I think we should just do this monthly. It was a lot of fun. (laughs) So thank you, everybody. 30 questions in. We wish that we could have answered every one, but Alice did her very best to get them in. And so we promise we'll do something again soon. But thank you, everybody, for joining us tonight. Special thanks again to Laura Stratton and Gabby McColgan and Alice Kleeman. Take care, everybody. Hope to see you again soon. Good night. Thank Thank you. Good night.